Are you ready to take a different view on leadership and what it means to you in your own personal life? Then listen into today's episode where I'm talking to Catherine Llewellyn. First of all, she has an amazing accent that you'll want to listen to for hours. And she talks about what leadership really is and how we can apply it to our own lives. We had a fun conversation, so I hope you enjoy it. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe wherever you're listening, rate, review, all that jazz, and help us to grow Spirit Cafe so that we can share more stories and conversations to perk up your soul. I appreciate you, and I can't wait to hear what you think of this episode of Spirit Cafe. Hi, I'm Tamara Zoner. Welcome to Spirit Cafe. Come in, sit down, and grab a cup of love. Welcome, Catherine Llewellyn, to Spirit Cafe. We're so happy to have you here today. I would love to invite you to give us a snapshot of who you are. And if you don't mind, throw in a little bit about your spiritual upbringing, since it's Spirit Cafe, or lack thereof. We never know what we're getting on this show. So take it away, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara, for having me on. So I am, um, I'm kind of uh, working some of the time, doing creative projects some of the time, chilling out and enjoying nature some of the time. I'm in that sort of place in my life, in my sort of mid to late 60s, where I've got a very rich mixture of of things going on. And um, I do a lot of work with people, one-to-one work helping them to really connect with who they are, what matters to them, how they can have their best life. Uh, I do a bit of work with groups. Um, I have a podcast. And I'm, I'm generally a pretty contented, relaxed human being at this point in my life, for which I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> and in, in, in regard to the spiritualness, uh, I, I was brought up in um, what you probably call a kind of bohemian culture okay. and I don't know if you're familiar with that idea but um whether the listeners are familiar with that but it was all very much about think for yourself you can be who you want to be and if there's an opportunity for being expressive or creative or whatever that was highly encouraged so that was very much the the energy of the of the life and we were not strictly religious there was no particular religion but there was very much a sense of um being encouraged to tune into what feels true for us. Truth was a really high value. Someone being untruthful was just completely unacceptable in, in our culture growing up. So it's a what you might call a sort of principled spiritual connection rather than a, a uh, designated um, modality of it. Right. I love that. And would, would you say that is the culture, you grew up in Wales, right? I, well, I didn't actually grow up in Wales. I grew up in England. Okay. But, you know, to Americans, England is just like five minutes away from Wales. So it's, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're a tiny, tiny little island over here. Now, I grew up in, in England, in southern England, um, which is, um, if anything, a slightly more privileged part of England. You know, not all that far from London. Okay, which part? Actually, I lived in um, uh, Hampshire for two years. And... Uh, it was very close to Basingstoke. Yeah, yeah. So I was in Oxfordshire, which is kind of north of Hampshire. Okay. Yeah, and, and similar kind of feeling of the people were quite comfortably off, a lot of them, and, you know, there, there was uh, – it, it, it was very beautiful. I grew up in the country in a little old cottage. Um, I was very, very lucky. Oh, nice, nice. So would you say that is the culture – that you were raised in, or was that more your family culture, that bohemian bohemian lifestyle and, and principled thinking? Well, I would say both, because the, the strongest part of my upbringing was my family, my parents. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were very, um, very hands-on, very involved parents, you okay. know, really, really interested in being parents. And, uh, you know, my father was always inventing ex- bizarre games for us to do that that really challenged us and helped us to grow and be much more creative and express. My mother was a painter. Oh, you know, nice. All these paints and there was lots of creative stuff going on. So it was definitely my family. Okay. Not so much school. school was kind of the opposite. School was 
the best thing you can do is grow up and get a good husband, young lady. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what a couple of decades can do to change that thinking in schools. <laughs> no. Wow. Okay. So you had this fabulous uh, family, it sounds like who really supported you being who you were, just whoever you were, free thinking. And you ended up going into psychology. Is that right? Yes. I actually, I didn't really know I was going into psychology. It just kind of happened because I didn't ever go and do a psychology degree or anything to begin with. I just kind of, um, I ended up doing um, an enlightenment program in the 1970s, late 1970s which a lot of people were doing that at the time. And I became much, much more self-aware and much more connected to my own spiritual connection and community and relationship and all that sort of thing. And ended up working with a group of people I'd met through that experience and ended up training people in voice work and communication work, which was very, it was like body work. It was very somatic. Mm -hmm. That led me on uh, into doing much more psychological work about self-awareness and personal development and self-actualization. And I kind of did that. I was sort of making it up as I went along and picking up stuff from other people. And I was working with some very talented people. And then much later in my 40s, I did a master's degree about humanistic psychology. And I discovered that what I'd been doing all this time was humanistic psychology. And I came out of that with my master's degree. So I then had a qualification, but I'd been doing it for 16 years before that. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of roundabout way to come to it. Right. And so who do you work with and what do you, uh, you know, when I coach, I always say, okay, I'm coach, but it's much, uh, it's a big blend of teaching, coaching and listening and reflecting. So uh, how would you describe your work and, and what actually inspires you about what you do? Thank you. Well, I'll answer the last part first because okay. it's the easy part. Which is, so what, what inspires me is that thing when you see the light go on in a person, that, that thing where someone's, someone's come to me and Sometimes they know why they've come to me and sometimes they've just heard my podcast and they just like my energy and they don't understand it. So you never know, but sometimes they're very clear about what they want. And there's that moment in the work when they suddenly realize that they've got what they said they wanted and they suddenly realize that they had not really believed it was going to be possible, mm. but it's, and there's that moment where the, it's like the soul lights up. You know, it's like they, they're always glowing now, that's incredibly inspiring to me. It's a, just such a beautiful thing to witness. Mm. And, and I never know exactly what it's going to look like when we get there. You know, I never know exactly how it's going to manifest in their life. But I know how to recognize that point. And they recognize that point because they can feel it in their body and in their soul. You know, it's a feeling. Yeah. So it's a really, that's really inspiring for me. And, and when I'm doing this work with people, I always start by saying to them, well, you know, what is it you hope to get out of this? And there's a conversation about that. And we always do quite a lot of deep work on um, them do a, doing a self-assessment of how they are and where they are now and everything about their environment also and everything that's around them, almost like a personal SWOT analysis mm -hmm. that they do. And we, we do it in, quite intuitively and quite deeply. And we tend to emphasize strengths, whereas previously often people have been in situations where weaknesses are being emphasized. So we're really finding what are the wonderful nuggets you've already got in you. And for a lot of people, that's an incredible revelation on its own. And we also do quite a lot of deep work on what is it that you want in every aspect and on every level and kind of trying to dis disentangle people, help people disentangle from all the expectations they're trying to live up to that very often are coming from other people or from the culture or from their own imagination of what they should be doing and sort of pulling that all away and coming to what does your heart want? What does your spirit want? Really, really, really. Now, once we've done those two pieces, the rest is really straightforward because we then say, right, which strengths do you want to employ for this next endeavor? Which okay. tools, right? So how do we really maximize that? And it's, it's, it's very, very exciting work. I just love it. 
<laughs> I can see you're glowing now. And you work with uh, leaders. So uh, what I was reading in your uh, bio was that you're working with quite high level leaders. And I'm curious, how do they initially respond to this, like, well, tap into your heart idea? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it, 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 it's really interesting because everyone has their own kind of language that they use to describe their experience and their, their relationship with their life. So when I, like you were saying with listening, mm -hmm. when I first meet them, the first conversation I'm doing, well, I do a lot of listening throughout, but I do a lot of listening. And some, one of the things I pick up on is their language, how, how they talk about these things that really matter to them. And then I'll sometimes actually use some of their language mm -hmm. when we start working, or I might sometimes say, so the thing you're saying in this way, I might say like this. So, so I'm not forcing them to use my language. I might offer bits of my language if I think it's going to add some value, or I might use some of theirs. So the word heart, for example, may or may not come in to begin with. Right. But if it does come in, very often they say it first. You know, what the people who would decide to work with me obviously believe they can trust me. And, and they often are really relieved to talk to somebody about stuff they might not really feel comfortable talking to anyone else about, mm -hmm. even their partner, you mm -hmm. know, because they've got to see their partner the next day and the next day and the next day. But me, they don't have to see me ever again, or they can see me as often as they want, and then I'm gone. So they can kind of control and boundary that exposure and vulnerability aspect. So they're then... They very often people come to me and disclose the most extraordinary things, even in the first conversation, because they're ready to do that. They want to do that. They're looking for someone they think they can do that with. So it's more a question of where are they at? And I'm responding to them more so than me saying, are you interested in talking about your heart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And how you said that uh, they're often surprised by uh, and I'm throwing the word surprised in there. That's not the word you used, but uh, that they're surprised by the strengths that they uncover. Mm. Is that, do you think, because culturally in the West, we tend to focus on so much of the negative or our weaknesses and building up those weaker muscles so we can be really strong or what's going on there? Well, what you just said is a massive part of it. We, 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 our minds are trained to forensically identify what's gone wrong, yeah. and forensically identify what's wrong with us. And to me, that's like an overreaction to uh, analytical thinking, which is incredibly valuable. We need it to run our businesses. It's vital. Mm -hmm. If we overapply it, then you're absolutely right. We create a negative self-image. And we're always chasing it because you can never fully get better from that. You just can't. And so we are very much conditioned in that way. But also a lot of people have achieved extraordinary success without realizing which strengths they're using to do it. Okay. Because most of our, a lot of our really strong strengths, because they've been with us our whole lives, we're not conscious of them. And in fact, I don't know if you've ever had this where I've said to somebody, God, you did that really, really well. Oh, and what are you talking about? It's easy. It's obvious. Well, to you, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to anybody else on the planet, right? You know, you you've got that, and they go, oh, "It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing." And because to them, it's so so normal. Yeah. Because yes. they're not conscious of it, they don't know how to choose to bring it into play because they're not aware of it. So, um, and it's surprising when they say, "Oh my God, I I have got that strength," and actually, I used that in that joint venture I just did. And actually, you're right. That would not have worked if I hadn't brought that into the situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how unaware we can be. I was only made aware of my own strength in communication and emotions and having those kinds of conversations that are very challenging for many people. And for me, it's it's what I thrive on. It's what I love. I always want to jump right into who are you and tell me your deepest, you know, desires and and like let's get really intimate right away. And I was talking to a close friend who that's not easy for at all. And he said to me, you you make it look easy. You make this look really easy, but it's not easy for me. And I thought, oh 
oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I just thought everybody could speak to their own emotions yes. and wasn't aware how challenging it can be. So what do you tell people who maybe are just moving through their lives? You know, they're not high powered leaders. They're your average Joe or Jane. What do they need to do to connect to their strengths and be leaders in their own lives? Well, I, I think people like that have, an, have one of the advantages people like that have is that they've probably got a lot of people in their lives at what you might call peer level you know, friends, colleagues, they've got a lot of people that they can talk to and say, look, let's, can we go for a drink or a coffee or whatever, have a conversation. Um, I'd like to tell you what I think some of your strengths are. Will you tell me what you think some of mine might be? Nice. Would you be up for that? I love so that. the very senior leaders, it's much harder for them to find someone to do that with. But people who are not in that position, it's much easier. Mm -hmm. to do that's a fun that's a fun dinner table <laughs> or you can do it with six people yeah you know like thanksgiving i you know i don't know anything about thanksgiving i'm british but <laughs> i believe people give thanks right so yeah. uh, you can do the same thing with strengths you can you can go around a table and say i just want to give thanks for that you have this beautiful like you were saying this beautiful ability to communicate emotions and the reason that's really means a lot to me is because that allows me then Mm -hmm. to accept my emotions a bit more and have a bit more courage or whatever it is. You might then say to them, I just want to give thanks for your brilliant, sharp, analytical mind that helped me sort through that stupid problem I had last week mm -hmm. where I was all over the place and couldn't sort it out. I don't mean to project on you what your thing is, but you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like... Yeah, actually, that was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all have these different things. And equally, self-reflection privately with a journal, I'm a great fan of. Mm -hmm. Looking back over the, our day or our week or whatever and saying, was there something where I was really satisfied how I managed that or took care of that? And how did I do that? How did I do that in a way that someone else might not have been able to? Mm. What, what did I have that someone else might not have? And another really beautiful way to do it is to look at, if you're watching a movie or a TV show or, or whatever, or reading a book, and there's a character that you really appreciate and absolutely adore. You look at that character and go, what is it about that person that I really adore? Have I got that in me? Because it takes one to know one. So if we really appreciate that, it's very possible that they've got a quality that we have and we are just loving seeing it out mm. there. So there's lots of ways. Yeah, I love that reflection there because you know, I go by the belief that we only meet ourselves and that we are always seeing in other people what's also within us. And that came to a, a clear example in my life with my best friend who I told, you know, I love being around you because I feel so free. Like you're such a free spirit. You're a free bird. You just, you, nothing stops you. You do whatever. And she turned to me and said that, well, I think you're free and that's why I love being around you. And it was so shocking to me because I'm such a, I'm a planner. I'm a Capricorn. I like a lot of structure and, mm. and my word that year, this was several years ago was, it was freedom. Mm. And, mm. and I experienced that in her presence. And then to have that reflected back was really joyful for me. And so I love that idea of just sitting down and reflecting to one another the strengths that we see in each other. And I, I hope if you're watching this or listening to this, that you're going to try this tonight with your family or your best friend or your partner, because that is so impactful in a relationship. How do you use it, Catherine, in your personal relationships? We've talked about your professional life, but tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and how you relate to the uh, people you're close to. Well, Oh, with the people I'm close to, I very often have that feeling of, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I have very often that feeling of, I'm sure that there's a way of mastering this and I've not done it, you know, and I, and I actually, I'm quite a competent person, you know. So when I'm in a very close relationship, um, I, that's where I meet the part of me that doesn't necessarily feel competent. Mm. What I mean by that is I don't mean I'm rubbish in relationships. What I mean is that's where I meet the part of me that um, 
that knows I don't know. You know, that I, I don't know exactly what this person is experiencing. They can't know exactly what I'm experiencing. So it, it's, a, it's a mystery. There's a, there's a mystery involved in close personal relationships, just like there is in any relationships. But it's very, very noticeable for me in personal relationships because they're the ones I'm most attached to. Mm-hmm. They're the ones I've got most skin in the game and, and you know, an agenda, <laughs> wanting it to be really, really great and yeah. wanting yeah. to make sure the other person's really having a good time and that, and so on. So it's really interesting. But I do, I'm, I'm very um, self-disclosing in relationships. I really share about what's going on with me. Um, I, I, I uh, share about my experiences around other people. You know, I'm I'm very, very open in that way. And that's partly because I've seen so many examples at which I've experienced some of those and witnessed where people haven't done that. And there's then subsequently been a lot of damage as a result. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you, you know, I was I was actually talking to someone the other day and saying, he, you know, he said, I'd much rather you tell me if there's something that's really bugging you and driving you up the wall now rather than in a year's time, because I'll be going, why didn't you tell me before? And how come we never see each other anymore? You know, that sort of. Right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very self-disclosing. I'm, um, I'm very appreciative of the people I'm very close to. I'm very kind of grateful to have them in my life. And, and so I'm quite loving and affectionate and, and giving. Some people find me a bit much, actually, in close relationships. <laughs> you're the kind of person I like the most <laughs> oh well cool right? <laughs> <laughs> yes you know because there's so many people who hold so much of themselves back and I'm often uh, I run a, a monthly group and we meet in person and mm. it's a meetup group in the area I live in and it's called create a life you love and mm. I always invite people to just show up as your perfectly imperfect self with all your flaws and perfections and just come and be who you are because this is the only way that we can be truly seen, loved, and accepted is if we actually show up as we are, not trying to be something we think other people want. So sometimes people have been called too much, right? Too much. And so we dim ourselves down. And Mm -hmm. so when someone like you says, I'm sometimes a little much, (laughs) thank you. Because how can I love who you truly are if I don't get to see it? Yes. You're giving me a version of yourself. That's right. Yeah. So of course I end up with the people around me who, who love that and, and are fine with it. You know that they because they have a big heart, they have the capacity for that. So over my life, there have been a lot of people I've kind of allowed to drift away from me, where it's not been a match. Right. And when I was much younger, I did used to think there was something wrong with me potentially, or something wrong with them. But actually, now I feel like there's nothing wrong with anybody. It's just we're all different in terms of our capacities and where we are in our lives, and and what we want, what we need, and what matters to us. And bless everybody. You know, that's my feeling about it now. Yeah. So I look at the people who are actually in my life now and I'm really grateful for them and they're grateful for me, uh, you know, and it's been a long road. You know, I've made some stupid mistakes, over the, you know, with people, but thinking that, you know, you could make it work with somebody, uh, you know, mm-hmm. but sometimes you just let it go. And then you actually always end. I always feel you end up with the people you're supposed to end up with. Yes, I like how you phrase that you've released people. And yeah. often when when I'm working with people who are starting to kind of up level their own life experience and be more of who they are, they're they're fearful of losing friends. And that's one of those tricky points that you just made sound so easy. You know, I've just released them. <laughs> that very eloquent accent of yours. And I've just released them. How do you advise people who are stepping more fully into themselves who are facing that challenge of outgrowing Mm. you know I'm putting this in quotes listeners outgrowing uh the people who you've been attached to for a long time how how does one deal with that it's hard I think the first thing is just to accept that it's hard I think that's very important because sometimes people are looking for an answer which will make it not hard Mm -hmm. I don't think there is one unless you medicate yourself, which I do not recommend. Mm -mm. And of course, a lot of us have done that, you know, 
earlier on. And, you know, that's not what I, I would say find um, find places in, in your life where you can feel at peace and whole just with yourself, whether that's prayer, meditation, walking, dance, painting, music, whatever it is. Find places like that and make sure you visit a place like that every single day. And that in that place, you are um, acknowledging and celebrating and grounding the fact that you are beautiful and perfect in solitude, just as, as in who you are. And that's very strengthening in those situations. Our next thing I would always say is, whoever you come across in life, whether it's someone you see all the time or a new person or someone who delivers something to the door, notice how you feel when you're around them and and sharpen the senses for who are the people where when you're around them, you feel beautiful, lovable, intelligent, intuitive, sensitive. Mark those people in your mind. And if it's appropriate and if you can, Spend more time with those people. It's, it, when I'm speaking, it, it sounds obvious, but it's <laughs> it, 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 this is the creative response to the problem. You know, spend more time with those people. And the more you do that, the more strengthened you will be, the more grounded you will be. Some of those people will challenge you, of course, but you will feel loved in the way they challenge you. So, yeah. And then it'll be relatively easier then to notice the people where you don't feel that way and to have the strength to have that conversation you need to have or to make a decision and let them go or just change your circumstances a bit so you don't have to see them, whatever it is you need to do. So I suppose it's personal grounding, strengthening, opening up to love and support, building that at the same time rather than just going cold turkey and dumping everyone out of your life and then there you are on your own crying in the dark in the rain Right. I don't suggest that either. <laughs> like the very graceful way that you expressed that. And 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 one of the things that I often say is that it all all of it begins with us noticing. Noticing mm-hmm. who we are, noticing where we are, noticing how we feel, noticing what we say to ourselves, noticing what people are saying to us or around us. And take it from there. And noticing how you feel with certain people is a beautiful first step. Yeah. And, and then, you know, being that leader in your own experience to say, well, I like the way I feel with this person. Yes. So I'm going to spend more time here, or I don't like the way that I feel with this person. So I'm going to spend less time here, even Mm -hmm. if it's family, even it's been a, you know, if it's been a friend for 20 years, it is okay. Uh, And it gets easier when we, when we like and respect ourselves more to step away from others and we can be loving and respectful in the way that we do that i think it's also very good to remember that not everyone needs us in our in their lives you know the people we don't fit with the people who don't fit with us we don't fit with them so it's probably better for them as well yes although you don't tell them that you don't say this is for your best good you don't do that (laughs) (laughs) but you, you, in a way, it's good to remember that as well, I think. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. So tell us, uh, what do you, if someone wanted to work with you, whether they are uh, high level or mid-level, how do you work with people? And I know you have a podcast. You mentioned that before. And so what is that podcast really about? Well, it's called Truth and Transcendence, which is a great title that I got from doing like one of those experiential exercises where you come up with the words intuitively. Okay. And I just loved it. So the idea is that when we, when we find our truth and connect with our truth, then we have the possibility of transcending. Now in my life, that has been a major lesson in my life. When I find my truth and connect with it, I can transcend. And it's a first step, right? So in, in the podcast, there are some solo episodes where I'm talking about a th- one theme or another, and there are guest episodes. And at the moment, I'm kind of alternating. Okay. So in the solo episodes, I'm talking about um, themes and topics that I think are really valuable for people. 
And sometimes they're really focused on leadership questions. Like there was one recently about your organism, your, your, your organization, your business. Is it a machine or is it an organism? Mm. That's a really important question for leaders, right? For people who are not leaders, it may not be quite such an important question, right? But they can apply it to uh, your your family, your group, mm. your club, your tribe. Is it a machine or is it an organism? And why does that matter? You know, or I did one just before Christmas a year or so going saying, the problems we have with other people over Christmas are, in fact, problems we have with ourselves. Mm -hmm. The whole 20-minute episode is about that. And I did that as a gift for everybody on Christmas Eve. I love it. You know, so there's a whole range. And then I get these incredible people coming on, you know, philosophers, psychologists, dancers, artists, um, leaders, podcasters, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I ask them questions about finding their truth and what their main learning has been in life and what would they like to say to leaders today and the episodes you know that the solo ones are usually about 20 minutes the longest ones an hour and the guest episodes are like an hour to two hours okay and it's once a week okay beautiful and so how do they how do we find that podcast so you can just go on any podcast app and, and go truth and transcendence and and is an ampersand, the squiggly thing. Mm-hmm. Or you can go to truth and transcendence with and the word in it, truth and transcendence dot buzzsprout dot com. So that's if you prefer to check out podcasts on a browser okay. rather than your phone. Perfect. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. What do you that's want it. people to know? Catherine, about leadership, whether they are in uh, positions of leadership in their working lives or only in their personal lives, because we are all leaders in our own life. We are. What do you want people to know about being a leader or how to lead? Well, so if you're going to lead, the obvious thing is you've got to be going somewhere. Otherwise, you can't lead anybody and you've got to know where you're going. And a lot of leaders try to lead other people when they don't really know where they're going and they hope that someone's going to tell them where they're supposed to be going. <laughs> That's really discouraging for the people who are trying to follow them. Right. We've, all been, we've all been there, I think. So, yeah, know where you're going. And I think at the moment, particularly with the way things are in the world at the moment, it's be- it behooves us as leaders on our own behalf or in a wider sense to think for ourselves and choose where we want to go and be very, very wary of just going with the flow of where everyone else seems to think they, we ought to be going. Because then you're not really a leader. You're really a follower. And everyone else is like a sub-follower, which is a really boring place to be. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the really inspiring leaders are the ones who have actually thought about it themselves. And they've gone, no, this is where I really believe I want to go and where I want to lead us. And it te- you can tell when people are like that. And once you've got that, it then becomes much more straightforward to describe that to people and to know who you want to bring with you and who who are the people where it's a fit. One of my podcast guests, I said, you know, do you think leaders should be thinking about this? And he does this very deep conscious movement work. He said, well, this is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, great. You know, and then he talked a bit about who it's for and who it's not. And a really good leader will be won't be for everybody they'll right. be for some people they're not pleasing all men or and women it's that and that's really important and then the second thing i'd like to say for leaders is a business or a project or a family or any endeavor with a whole group of people following a leader works when everybody feels like they're getting more out of it than they're putting in mm. a win 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 trade yes. whether that's Financially, with goods, with emotions, psychologically, time, effort, doing the chores, et cetera, et cetera. If everyone feels like they're getting more out of it than they're putting in, that's going to take off. The minute that's not the case, that needs addressing. Mm, Yeah, good advice. That is so true from 
every uh, every level from family system up through a corporation that is so vital that we all feel like we're getting something out of it and at least as much as we're putting into it i would say more yeah because otherwise you might as well just not do it because it's it's like a zero sum <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like you you don't choose someone to be your partner because you don't feel any worse than usual when you're with them <laughs> you know you you choose them because because you feel fantastic when you're with them right <laughs> very clear point much better <laughs> Yeah, like you're good enough, I guess. <laughs> I've got a bit of a bias about this one, personally. You know, I've got a bit of a thing about it. But I'm really into this particular theme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on life and leadership and telling us about your beautiful bohemian upbringing. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to talk to you. And I thank you. Any last parting words for listeners or viewers? Well, thank you very much for listening and watching. And uh, thank you so much, uh, T- Tamara. It's been just a real delight doing this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone uh, out there watching or listening today. I appreciate you. And I will talk to you again next week. Bye. Thank you for joining us on Spirit Cafe. Please leave all comments on our Spirit Cafe Facebook page or in the comments below our YouTube videos.